Hi, it's Greg Harrell here with another Vim screencast. Um, and tonight I want to talk about Vim plugin managers. And I'm going to share what is probably an unpopular opinion, and that is that you don't need a Vim plugin manager. The reason why I think it's going to be unpopular is people obviously love their plugin managers. I've got a few open here in browser tabs, but if you just look at how many of these there are and also how many stars they have, how much evidence of usage is out there, like, there's obviously something here that people find likeable and useful. Um, having said that though, I don't really like pulling in third party dependencies unless I think there's a clear value there. And in this particular case, I feel like you can get everything that I care about done without a plugin manager because the functionality is already there built into Vim and Kit. So let's just do a quick survey of what's out there and then I'm gonna dive into my dot files and show how I try to meet the same ends without the plugins. So the first one here is the Vim add-on manager, which as you can see has got about 600 stars. This is one of the oldest, if not the oldest plugin managers. Uh, there's Pathogen, another one that's been around for a while and very minimal, 11,000 stars. Uh, Vundle, as far as I can tell, is currently unmaintained because there have been no commits in over a year. 20,000 stars, a lot of people still probably use this. Um, Neo Bundle, 2,000 stars. Vim plug, to my understanding, is the most popular one right now with 15,000 stars and under active development. Uh, Vault, Vim Vault, is one that started much more recently. Um, only 100 stars, but that's still actual interest that people have in this thing. I've never used it, but it's there. And then there's DN, which is the successor to Neo Bundle, over 2,000 stars. Uh, so, what do these things do that would matter, that I would want to bring over into Vim even if I'm not using them? Well, one thing is, I need a way to get plugins and install them. Another is, uh, I need a way to potentially configure plugins such as you know activate and deactivate plugins and then the the third thing that I would care about would be the ability to load plugins on demand so for example if a plugin is bloated I don't I may not want to run it until I hit a particular mapping or command that needs that plugin so let's look at how you can achieve those goals uh, without using a plugin manager um, by looking at my dot files now some of these things are pretty deep topics that go beyond the scope of a quick screencast. So I'm not actually going to you know, fully detail the solution, but I am going to at least provide a pointer for like, this is the direction that you would head in if you wanted to do it. So let's start by looking at where I keep the plugins. So I keep them in Git submodules, and that is probably going to lead me to my second unpopular statement in this screencast, and that is that Git submodules are just fine. <laughs> in fact, they can be really good for some use cases. And I think this is one of them. I think Git submodules tend to get a lot of hate because historically they were pretty hard to use. But as far as I can tell, most of the usability issues, if not all of them, have been totally ironed out at this point. And so I want to give you a few reasons why these are good for this use case. Um, so if you look at these, you'll see you know, under .vim slash pack slash bundle slash opt and then the plugin name, they're just directories, right? Each of these directories corresponds to a Git repo, a checkout of the plugin code. Uh, and one thing I really like about this is because it is a Git repo, I can do anything in there that I would do in a Git repo. So that means I can do things like prepare a pull request to submit to an, an upstream project. Uh, I can test a patch, I can test a bug. If I submit a patch to an upstream project that does not get accepted, I could point my submodule at a fork. I can keep my patch up to date however I see fit, whether that be rebasing or merging, because I can do anything in there that I would do in a Git, Git repo. And this comes into its own, I think, with my own plugins, where I have a few of these in here, like you know, Command T, Ferret, Loop, Pinnacle, Replay, Scalpel, Terminus. If somebody sends me a PR, because I'm iterating on my repo embedded in my dot files, I'm always testing code that's under development in a real environment. So I'm actually using Vim every day testing this stuff, dog fooding, whatever feature I might be about to ship or whatever bug fix I'm considering merging. So that makes them really valuable to me. And finally, another thing that I like about Git submodules is that they point at a specific SHA-1 hash of a commit. Some people don't like that. They would rather that a submodule be more fluid, but for me, that would be a liability because I use Vim to get my job done. So I want to control my dependencies uh, in a very rigorous way and only update them when I make an explicit choice to do so. And so, you know, at the end of the day, because they're Git repos, you can still point them at branches, right? 
It's just that the submodule points at a specific commit on that branch. And so if you want to update, you pull or merge or rebase or whatever you want to choose as your mechanism for updating the, the Git submodule, right? There's nothing stopping you from doing a batch update. Um, I do have a script that updates them all in one go. Um, but my most common use case is just to go into a specific one when I find a bug or identify a feature that I need and update one at a time. Because with a tool like this that I depend on, it's a kind of, if it ain't break, don't fix it kind of mentality that I want to follow here. And so all of those things that I said are great about submodules apply out of the box with Git because it's built into Git. So you don't have to install anything and you have this built-in way of getting all this code and keeping it up to date. So before I move on from the topic of Git submodules, I just want to provide one little pro tip, one little usability thing um, that I recently became aware of. If we look in the .git modules file here, you can see this is a file that Git maintains whenever I add a Git submodule. So just saying I add you know, Git submodule add and then I add vim repeat. So it creates this section here with a heading and a name and some configuration like the path where the submodule is checked out and the URL that it should be updated from. And so by default, by default, what Vim will do is the name will actually be identical to the path. So where it says roles.files.files.vim, etc., that would actually be the name that Git assigns it by default. But I have not accepted the default because it drives me crazy to have that as a name. Because what will happen, what will happen when you move a submodule, you run git mv and then you'll move the submodule just like you would move any other file. It will come in here and it will update this config for you and it will move the files on disk and that's all great but it won't change the name and nor should it change the name right because the name is just an opaque handle it doesn't have any semantic you know internal structure it's just intended to identify a thing so you wind up with a name which will be something like you know foo bar baz vim repeat but because you moved uh vim repeat the path is not foo bar baz vim repeat it's now like baz bar foo vim repeat and the name and the path don't match and it's super distracting and confusing and I much prefer to have a stable, unique, immutable name, which is unlikely to change. In the case of Vim plugins, it's just the name of the plugin because they're not going to get renamed, right? Which means I can move my submodules without having any of this weirdness of divergent name and path creeping into the into the uh, the Git modules file. That that is really my only complaint about submodules, and it's easy to fix. Just when you add something, do you get submodule add dash dash name and give it a unique name, and then that problem goes away. Other than that, I'm delighted with how submodules have been working out for me for like many, many years for this purpose. So at this point, we've got a mechanism for getting the code. Let's look at a couple of those other usage scenarios that I talked about, uh, such as you know, having the code, like how do you activate it in Vim? So I'm going to open my uh, VimRC file here. You'll see here that I'm using the Vim packages feature. Uh, so that's in the help. Packages, this is something that was added to Vim maybe a little bit before Vim 8 came out. It's also uh, available in NeoVim, so it works on any modern Vim. Um, and you'll see here, if has packages, I'm going to do this setup. There's no fold here. Um, and else, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to fall back to the old pathogen way of doing things. So pathogen is just going to grab all my plugin files and set up the runtime path so that they get evaluated and available at runtime. I'm pretty sure this else branch is not ever executing on any machine that I routinely use. So, what does the packages feature do? It does a lot of the things that a, pack, a plugin manager will do. And to be honest, some of the things it does, I don't even know why, why the feature is implemented. So one example of that is, you can set up a pack path, which is a list of places that Vim will look for packages. I mean, by default, there's a few places in this path. One of them is, you know, dot vim slash pack. Why you would want to have multiple of these is somewhat beyond me. Like maybe there's some shared central location where you want it, but usually I think people want these things as close as possible to home in the home directory. So I don't really know why anyone would want the pack path. Uh, the other thing it has is the ability to group plugins into directories. Once again, like why would you want to have a bundle of a set of plugins that are grouped together when you could just have them all in one place. I don't know. I'm sure you could come up with a reason, but to me it just seems unnecessary. So all of my plugins are in one place. .vim slash pack slash bundle. And the word bundle is just arbitrary, right? Um, because it's the word that Pathogen used to use. Uh, so 
If you read the help, you're probably gonna get really confused because there's pack add, pack add bang, um, there's pack load all, and there's a bunch of other stuff like the pack path. But really all that you need if you wanna emulate a plugin manager is, is what I have here. Um, so let me create a split here and let's look at our vim um, pack bundle opt directory. So these are my plugins that I'm gonna load. Um, the word opt means that they won't be loaded automatically. Because one way to set this up would be to put them in a directory called start instead of opt, and then Vim would just load them without you doing anything. The reason why I want them in opt is so that I can explicitly trigger that they be loaded. And the reason I want them to be explicitly triggered is because then I can have one line per plugin in my VimRC here, and I can do things like turn off a plugin by commenting it out. However, at the moment I don't have anything turned off. Um, they're all in there, and so at startup, these will run and it'll be just like what would have happened anyway if I had have stored them in my start directory. So why pack add bang? Pack add bang tells Vim to get ready to load the package but not actually load it. So this is really just registering it and then what's gonna happen at the end once it finishes reading your VMRC is then it's gonna go and load all the plugins. So pack add bang is just a little bit closer to what the natural sequence would look like if you were to just dump these in your package's you know, start directory. One little gotcha that I just figured out is that if you want FT detect subdirectories to be loaded as part of this process, you have to make sure that in your VMRC you haven't called syntax on or file type, uh, a file type command before you do the package registration. Because if you do it before, then it won't pick up FT detect files and you would have to use pack add without the bang, which confusingly loads it eagerly rather than merely registering it and then loading it as part of the startup sequence. Um, so this stuff is a little bit tricky and it's really hard to figure all that out by reading the help. But luckily somebody else has read the help and it just tells you <laughs> Put your syntax and file type directive after the package registration. Use pack add bang. Fine. So what's the other use case? The other use case is plugins that you don't want to load as part of the startup sequence because they slow it down too much. So you'll see I've profiled my startup and I'm pretty happy with it. So if I, if I run Vim, you'll see that it does me into a screen ready to edit pretty quickly. I, I'm guessing it's about 100 milliseconds, maybe 125. And that's because I've audited this and I, I know all of these load fast enough that they can just be loaded as, at startup. But if you look here on the list of plugins, you'll see that there's some here that are not in that list. So one example would be Nerd Tree. There it is. So Nerd Tree's in my file system, but not in the list. Why is that? It's because Nerd Tree's one of the slow ones. Um, and so something that plugin managers do is they provide you with a mechanism for loading a plugin on demand when you run a command or when you hit a mapping. So you can do that with VimScript. So let's take that nerd tree example. Nerd tree. Mm, if I could spell nerd tree, it would be much better. There we go. Um, so I've got a couple of uh, functions here that you can see. So here's this first one, um, Winsent plugin pack add. That just loads eagerly. And the reason why we might want to load eagerly is if I invoke Vim with a directory argument. So I'm going to demo that. Just say I load Vim dot. I want to open the dot directory. So at that point, it loaded nerd tree eagerly and now this is nerd tree, right? Um, however, if I like vim git modules, it hasn't loaded nerd tree yet. Um, and it will only load nerd tree if I run a nerd tree related command. So that's what that if does. Basically, if the in, if the argument is uh, a directory or any of the arguments, then we're going to load nerd tree eagerly and we're going to set up some mappings. On the other hand, if I'm not loading Vim with a directory argument, then we call Winsent plugin lazy, which as you can see has a bit of configuration here. I can tell it to load from the nerd tree pack. Uh, the plugin that I want to load is nerdtree.vim, and these are the commands that I want registered. So basically, even though I might not have used nerd tree and might not have loaded it, I can type, you know, colon nerd tree, uh, if I could remember how to spell it. And this command will load the nerd tree plugin and then run the real nerd tree command. Likewise, um, with this, these mappings here that are being set up, uh, if I hit one of these mappings, it will load the actual plugin and then delegate to the, to the actual functionality of the plugin. So uh, once again, it's beyond the scope of the screencast to go into how these functions are defined, but I'll put a link to my dot files so you can see how you could cook something like this up with a bit of Vim script.
And I much prefer to have a bit of Inscript than like yet another third party dependency. Um, and I think another reason why it's good to do this without third party dependencies, and this is probably, it might be ridiculous, but I like the fact that if I clone my dot files and then go offline, I have everything I need to start up Vim. With a lot of these plugin managers, if I clone my dot files and then I start up Vim like off in the forest without an internet connection, then I can't get my, I can't use Vim, right? Because what the plugin managers do is like download the plugin for you at that moment. So I like that separation of concerns. Git for getting the code and Vimscript for managing the code. Um, and so with those dependencies, I'm all covered. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say about uh, plugin managers at this point. So um, like I said, I'm not trying to convince anyone not to do it. If you're happy with your plugin manager, I hope you continue to enjoy using it. But I just wanted to show this as a, an alternative perspective and I hope it's been interesting for you. Um, I think in my next screencast, I'm going to get back towards what I usually do, which is more of a kind of tips and demo kind of uh, angle. So if you want to find out about when the next one comes out, just hit the subscribe button. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you later.